Thank you for joining our virtual panel, Past, Present, Future, the Chinese Communist Party at 100. The US-China Policy Foundation is honored to welcome our speakers today, Dr. Bruce Dixon, Dr. Douglas Paul, and Dr. Chi Wang. They will each share individual remarks, followed by a brief Q&A. Our first speaker is Dr. Bruce Dixon. Bruce Dixon is Professor of Political Science and International Affairs and Chair of the Political Science Department at George Washington University. His research and teaching focus is on political dynamics in China, especially the adaptability of the Chinese Communist Party and the regime it governs. His most recent book is The Party and the People, Chinese Politics in the 21st Century. His topic today is The Party Leads It All, the Leninist revival in China. Dr. Dixon. All right, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I wanna begin by thanking the US China Policy Foundation for inviting me here today and thank all of you for, for being here. It'd be kind of lonely if it was just uh, the four of us uh, talking to each other. Um, in just over a week, the, the Chinese Communist Party will be, will be recognizing its 100th anniversary uh, founded back in 1921. Um, and in recent years, most of the focus in Chinese politics has really, has really centered on Xi Jinping himself as both the general secretary of the party, the president of the country, uh, and the way that he has consolidated his power in ways that previous leaders had, had been unable to do. Uh, but the, the focus on Xi himself as an individual leader uh, uh, moves attention away from a parallel trend, which is the greater prominence of the, the CCP in everyday life. Uh, for much of the reform era, the party had become less visible, in many ways less relevant for most people in China. But under Xi Jinping, the party is once again uh, at the center of, of everything. Uh, and this is what I refer to as the revival of Leninism in the country, that the, the Leninist nature of the party and the political system is becoming more prominent, more important than it had been uh, in the recent past. So I look at three key aspects of what a Leninist party is all about. Um, and then uh, look at the implications of them. And so the three key uh, factors are uh, selective recruitment into the party, the party's oversight over the government, especially the policy process, and the way in which the party monitors and controls society. And much of the trends, most of the trends I'll be talking about didn't begin with Xi, there's sort of perennial features of the Communist Party, uh, but they've accelerated, been accentuated under, under Xi's rule. Uh, so first of all, looking at, at selective recruitment. Uh, the, the party has been very selective at who it admits into the party. Less than 7% of the population belongs to the party. Uh, so it's a very small selective group, still a very elite party, but it's no longer the, the uh, traditional revolutionary classes of the farmers, the workers and the soldiers. Now it's the urban educated elite, many ways the middle class that is now the, the uh, key elements, key aspects uh, of the party. Uh, the main group of people who are the main pool of new members of the party are college students. Um, and uh, again, focusing on sort of the, the importance of, of the skills, the traits that the party needs to pursue its economic agenda uh, and that's, that's a, a key element. Most people who join the party are not joining because of particular ideological or political affinity for the party. They're doing it for the career benefits and the party recognizes that. Uh, most people who join the party do not work for the party or the government bureaucracies. They work for state-owned enterprises, they work for private enterprises or even international ones, banks, hospitals, universities. Uh, there's, there's a recognition in all these areas that uh, there's a, a definite glass ceiling for people who are not party members. So if you want to rise to prominent positions, even mid-level positions, whether for the state bureaucracy or in the private sector, uh, finance, whatever, uh, being a party member has key advantages. And so that's why to be most people uh, join the party. And that's been true for the past couple of decades for much of the reform period. 
what has changed is now that the party expects more from its members than it used to. Um, expects them to get involved in voluntary efforts uh, of mobilizing them for different activities, activities that would serve as uh, role models for other people. Um, it, it expects them to show more explicit forms of support and loyalty to the party than they used to and expects them to attend party meetings much more often than they used to, uh, to, to read every speech that Xi Jinping gives, every major document, uh, in, in sort of an intrusion in the lives of everyday party members that were not there before. Another key trend is that uh, the party is more selective than it used to be. Uh, it used to be, it's always been hard to get into the party, um, but under Xi, it's been growing much more slowly. In the years before she came into office, uh, the party was growing about 3% per year. Uh, it's down to about 1% per year now. Uh, where there's greater scrutiny, scrutiny over who gets in um, and the numbers are just smaller. And one consequence of that is that fewer people are applying to join, uh, either because they no longer see it being beneficial or don't want to be in the party, or they don't think it's worth applying because, um, because it's tougher to get in. Exactly why that trend exists is, is hard to know without more direct research, but almost any research having to do with party is, is sensitive uh, and this certainly is one of them. Uh, so one key aspect of Elena's party is that it is very selective at who it, who it lets in. Uh, a second key aspect of it is how it oversees the government and especially the policy process. Uh, one way of doing so is that it appoints its own members to all key party and government positions, military positions as well, um, appoints them uh, and they're sort of their, their uh, agents in uh, different, uh, different parts of bureaucracy. Uh, another key way of, of overseeing what the, what the government does and how policy is implemented is through what are known as leading small groups. These are official formal groups, often not very well publicized, but the number of them has really, really blossomed in, during, uh, during the Xi Jinping era. So there's about 50% more of these leading small groups than there were when she came into office. And he himself chairs uh, most of these new ones uh, as well as some of the, the older, the original ones. So it's both she getting more consolidation over the policy process, but the party itself uh, having a more central role of overseeing different, different uh, policy arenas um, in the, in, Years ago, uh, scholars like Ken Lieberthal, Mike Oxenberg, Mike Lampton uh, wrote about the fragmented authoritarian nature of the policy process in China. Under Xi Jinping, it's less fragmented and much more authoritarian, uh, much more centralized uh, with the party overseeing much of what happens. At the local level, uh, local officials have less incentive now to be innovative, to pursue new reforms, in large part because of the anti-corruption campaign that, that rooted out uh, so many of both um, Xi's alleged opponents, but also had somewhat of a chilling effect on local officials as being unwilling to rock the boat, try something new for fear that they might be seen as being uh, unloyal to Xi. So mostly what lo local officials are concerned about is making clear that they are supportive of his, his policy agenda. And that's likely to continue up through the 20th Party of Congress that will happen in fall of 2022. Um, so in different ways, the policy process becoming more, more centralized uh, and the party having more control uh, over all key aspects of it. Uh, the third element uh, to, to look at is the way in which the party monitors and tries to control society uh, in two key ways. One is what's referred to as party building where it creates party cells within workplaces and neighborhoods to both monitor what party members are doing there, but also to be the party's eyes and ears for what happens uh, in, in those areas. Two key, two key areas that have been focused on under she has been the private sector and civil society organizations. So the party has been actively trying to 
build party cells in private firms going back to the 1990s, but especially into the 2000s. Uh, by 2017, over 70% of private firms had party cells within them. Uh, originally, these party cells didn't, uh, weren't that much of an obstacle to what the firms did. In many cases, if the owner himself or herself was a party member, they would share the party cell in their own firm. So it had more of a supportive role. Uh, now the party seems to wanna to have more explicit, explicit statements and showings of loyalty to the party and to she in particular in exchange for the party's support for, for their activities. Uh, social organizations uh, or NGOs in the country, uh, there are somewhere around 600,000 officially registered NGOs in the country. Estimates are over a million more unregistered but active. Uh, but uh, just in the past few months has been a renewed effort to shut down the unregistered NGOs uh, or force them to be, become officially registered. Um, in, uh, back in 2017, uh, the last time the party reported information about uh, it's, it's the number of its party cells in both private firms and in NGOs. Uh, it reported it had 60% of, of these NGOs had a party cell within them. It's probably an exaggeration. It probably only includes the officially registered NGOs and the ones that are big enough to have the right number of party members and most of them are quite small, but nevertheless, an indication that it, it is trying to actively control what's happening uh, within these organizations. Um, the party sees civil society as a much bigger threat than uh, the private sector. Uh, and so it is trying to control the organizations, less interested in recruiting the, the leaders of the organizations into the party, the way it has uh, for private entrepreneurs. Uh, at the local level, local officials recognize the benefits of these organizations that they provide useful services, they provide job training, uh, they provide cultural activities, uh, they provide en environmental awareness. And so in the past, they've worked with both registered and unregistered organizations. Uh, under she, there's now an effort to really clamp down on and even eliminate the unregistered ones. Second way the party tries to monitor and control society is through technology. Uh, we've seen this most extensively in Xinjiang uh, but has, has been rolling out to other parts of the country as well. Uh, during the period of the party's attempt to control COVID in the country, uh, it used technology to um, be able to, uh, people had to report on a daily basis their health conditions. Uh, they had to use a QR code on their cell phone to board buses, to enter buildings, to get into classrooms. Um, there are now at most universities, cameras in classrooms to record and monitor what teachers and students have to say. Uh, the CCP is now better able to monitor where people are going, who they're meeting, what they're doing in real time in ways they never could before. The party has always wanted to have that type of, of monitoring capability and technology now gives it the opportunity to do so combined with greater censorship and control uh, over the use of VPNs in the country for people to access information online, the CCP is better able to uh, both uh, monitor and control the flow of information uh, throughout society. So what, what is the implications of these, uh, these trends? Uh, so I wanna ask three questions for which I don't have the answer to. I wish I did, because uh, it would tell us much about the future of the party. First of all, are these this reassertion of the party's Leninist qualities and reinvigoration, reintroduction into most aspects of life in China, is this Xi's own priorities or is there more of a general consensus among party leaders? It's difficult to say given how opaque the, the top leadership of the party is. Um, in regards to whether it's his own personal predilections or, or consensus view, what are they afraid of? Why are they so worried about trying to monitor and control um, so much? There's no organiz organized opposition in the country. There's no opposition leader like Nelson Mandela in South Africa or 
Sakharov, Solzhenitsyn, more recently Navalny, Navalny in Russia. Previous studies show repeatedly high levels of popular support for the party. So why is the party trying so hard to monitor private firms, NGOs, universities, and society more generally? Third, how viable is these renewed, uh, this renewed emphasis on Leninism, the Leninist character of the party, and the ties between the party and the people? Uh, society is now more diverse, more mobile, more technologically, technologically savvy than it used to be. Uh, the old ways of party control may not work in, in this situation. In fact, they never worked that well to begin with, uh, but now with increasing diverse society, probably even less likely to have be effective. By reasserting the party into everyday life, uh, they may overplay their hand uh, and lead to a backlash as people feel the pinch of the party's um, attempts to control it, uh, even though they pose no particular threat to the party. Now this type of backlash is often predicted, but we've seen so far very little evidence of it, but it's something important to, to watch. So these are kind of three questions having to do with the party going forward. And the answers to those questions as they unfold in coming months and years will tell us much about the ongoing viability of the party as China's ruling party now that it's turning 100. Um, with that, thank you. I'll look forward to your comments, questions later on in our event today. Thank you, Dr. Dixon, for those great remarks. Our next speaker today is Dr. Douglas Paul. Dr. Paul is a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He previously served as vice chairman of J.P. Morgan Chase International from 2006 to 2008, and was an unofficial U.S. representative to Taiwan as director of the American Institute in, in Taiwan from 2002 to 2006. He was on the National Security Council staffs of Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush between 1986 and 1993 as director of Asian Affairs and then as senior director and special assistant to the president. Paul held positions in the policy planning staff at the State Department as a senior analyst for the CIA and at U.S. embassies in Singapore and Beijing. He has spoken and published frequently on Asian affairs and national security issues. Dr. Paul will be discussing the CCP and U.S.-China relations. Dr. Paul? Well, thank you very much, Adelaide. And um, thank you to the U.S.-China Policy Foundation for this opportunity to join with um, Wang Qi and Bruce Dixon. Uh, I, I'm honored to be in their company. Uh, Bruce Dixon's new book on the party and the people um, really captures the, uh, this, this tension between how a, a party can repress and yet be responsive at the same time to its people. And despite the, the failure of communist parties left and right in the last 30 years has persisted in maintaining its grip on power and I recommend it. What I'm talking about today is US-China relations and um, of course, this is the 100th anniversary coming up of the Communist Party's founding, and it's going to be a massively celebrated event in China over the next month. Um, U.S.-China relations don't go back, uh, to my knowledge, to back to 1921. Whatever iterations there were, uh, weren't much uh, in that period, leading up until 1945-46, when uh, America's most successful public servant, uh, General George Marshall was assigned to the Marshall mission to try to uh, help put an end to the Chinese Civil War between the, the nationalists led by Chiang Kai-shek and the communists led by Mao Zedong uh, in the aftermath of World War II and the defeat of Japan. Uh, I'm not going to go into that today. Uh, there was also the Dixie mission during the war with, where some American officials tried to establish relationships with the components of the opposition to Japan, which were embodied by Communist Party elements out in Northwestern China. Um, I think I, I'm gonna to try to skip across a lot of the history the way a stone skips across a body of water. And I'll touch on a few points where we've been between the US and China. Most importantly, of course, was the, um, the uh, period 
1948 through the 1949 uh, conquest of China by the Communist Party, the defeat of Chiang Kai-shek, uh, sending him in retreat to Taiwan, where he established a nationalist government uh, called the Republic of China in Taipei, uh, in hopes of returning to the mainland. Um, the U.S. was quite ambivalent with him. many in the U.S. government had reached the conclusion that uh, Zhang's times ahead was limited, that the PRC would be uh, swallowing up Taiwan despite its history of being a Japanese colony and having other different statuses over, over time. Uh, and that, so we just had to wait. And so the American embassy in Nanjing, which had stayed on after uh, Chiang Kai-shek departed for Taiwan, uh, didn't really close operations and anticipated opening relations with the new communist government. But events were moving fast in the late 1940s. The, uh, one of the big moments in thinking in American policy circles was the Czech coup in 1948. And then of course the famous uh, Winston Churchill speech about the uh, Iron Curtain descending across Europe. Uh, what had been wartime collaboration was becoming more and more uh, post-war, uh, pre-Cold War division between the uh, Soviet-led part of the world and the American-led uh, rest of the free world. The, um, of course, the great defining moment for the U.S. Uh, was when somehow Kim Il-sung, and the this history of this is a bit interesting and complicated, but Kim Il-sung persuaded Stalin and Mao to support his invasion of South Korea. And in the aftermath of the Czech coup and other developments uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, the U.S. saw uh, the being vague about defending the government in South Korea or else other governments with a, um, a orientation to the West uh, was not going to be in their interest. And so in the aftermath of the North Korean invasion of the South, the U.S. then tilted toward back to Chiang Kai-shek and supported him uh, on the one hand, trying to restrain him from reattacking the mainland because that looked to be a hopeless oper operation, but at the same time, interposing the American Seventh Fleet to keep China from taking over Taiwan during the distraction of the war taking place on South Korea. Um, that really set us up for a systemic competition with China, uh, trade, was embargoed, personnel movement was forbidden. Uh, the US uh, pulled out its diplomats from the mainland. We had to extract the remaining teachers and missionaries and others who were on the mainland. And we had a few left behind who got caught up in the grinding wheels of history. But we were into a full out uh, systemic confrontation, mostly initially focused on Moscow with China as a kind of uh, party, uh, not in the lead, but certainly important. Uh, but the U.S. was not going to be looking to improving or somehow finessing traditional diplomacy, which is kind of blind to ideological backgrounds, whether you're a monarchy or a, a democracy or something else. Diplomacy goes on because you have to do the affairs of state, irrespective of the systems. But in this case, the systems became very important through the early 1950s. Um, Taiwan remained you know, the great bone of contention between the US and China, the US uh, protecting uh, Chiang Kai-shek's regime, China's believing increasingly over time that recapturing or somehow unifying with Taiwan was necessary for the uh, successful achievement of the Communist Party's mandate to um, have China stand up again and no longer be divided by foreign powers. The 1954-55, um, the uh, passing of Stalin, who had been a great influence on Mao, and the uh, end of the war on the Korean Peninsula allowed Mao to think about trying to put pressure on Taiwan again. We had 1954-55, Straits crisis, uh, shelling of the 
offshore islands just off the mainland that were still controlled by Taiwan. And uh, that was, uh, in the end, not consequential. It didn't get anywhere. And in 1955, the Chinese Communist Foreign Minister uh, reached out to the U.S. and offered himself a, uh, a stepping stone down from the confrontation that had preceded the period and said, let's get together and talk about practical matters, such as the return of those personnel who were not yet returned from either the US to China or China to the US in the aftermath of the conclusion of the revolution in 1949-50. Um, that began a new process called the Warsaw Talks. Uh, uh, Ambassador Wang Bingnan and American diplomat Alexis Johnson met first in Geneva and then subsequently in Warsaw periodically. Uh, and this was the kind of one door open for traditional diplomacy that uh, was permitted under the otherwise blinding struggle of two opposing systems. And that went on intermittently from 1955 to 1970. Uh, no great results, but nonetheless, a small opening between our two systems. Obviously in um, at the end of the uh, 1960s and going into the early 1970s, both the US and China were confronted with internal and external challenges that caused them to reevaluate their relationship that I can't, you know, people in this broadcast will know a lot of the history without going into the detail of why the Vietnam War did not win and did not go over well for the US. Uh, we were in a, a confrontation with the Soviet Union. Russia had exercised its muscle again in, in Czechoslovakia, suppressing the Prague Spring in 1968, which accentuated the differences between Moscow and Beijing. Uh, and so opportunities were being created. And in China, the Cultural Revolution had uh, erupted, done tremendous damage, strengthened the role of the military, and uh, had come to the end of its course. It was time to wrap it up. Mao had his own uh, thoughts at the time. Uh, clearly he needed a stepping stone to get down from the Cultural Revolution and to find a new path forward. Uh, Zhou Enlai was very much involved in facilitating that, but always in step with his leader Mao. And on the US side, Nixon wanted to rebuild the American position internationally, reposition us strategically, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, internationally in order to reify his position domestically in the US. And so Nixon floated a famous article in Foreign Affairs talking about how China couldn't be excluded from the uh, main body of international discourse that he should, China should be brought back into contact with the US. And this signal uh, materialized when he became president. He sent Richard, he sent to Henry Kissinger to China. Uh, this is, you know, as I say, skipping across the surface here. Uh, Henry Kissinger went secretly to China in 1971 to prepare the way for ultimately Nixon's um, certainly politically triumphant visit to China later in early 1972. But what often we forget in looking back on that history was that uh, there was there was a successor to Mao, the man who promoted Mao Zedong's uh, personality cult was designated successor, Lin Biao. And uh, Lin Biao, in, now we now know in September 1971, attempted to escape the country. What we don't know really is how much that was done in reaction to the discussion that Mao and Zhou Enlai were having about uh, developing some kind of new relationship with the capitalist United States and uh, how much it had to do with you know, power grabbing and the like. I would love to talk to Chinese scholars like Zhang Baijia at Peking University. I had a conversation years ago with uh, Chen Zongjing, who was the man who was sitting at uh, the side of Mao and Zhou in that period. Uh, but I didn't know enough to ask him the question back then. Uh, what was really going on with Lin Biao? I know Nixon sent Christmas cards to the entire Chinese leadership in late 1971. And all of them received a formal response, but from Lin Biao. And so this was for those of us watching US-China relations with, through the Haruspice. Uh, 
Uh, this was a sign that maybe something was going on and they weren't all on the same a wavelength with restoring or, or starting up a new relationship with the US. But from that period forward, we really relegated our ideological differences between our system and the Chinese Communist Party um, to greater affairs of state. We were interested in counterbalancing Soviet power. China had an interest, we had an interest in common. And that became the strategic uh, uh, cement for US-China relations. Uh, we added to that cement and we firmed it up over the subsequent years. US domestic politics with Nixon's fall from grace and uh, uh, China's own uh, efforts to start, stop and start again on restoring uh, reform in, in China uh, caused some time to be lost. But by the end of the 1970s, we were uh, prepared under the presidency of Jimmy Carter who had campaign from the very beginning on human rights and systemic uh, issues when he was opposing Nixon and trying to get elected. Nonetheless, he put those to one side and said we have an important state interest to fulfill in developing relations with the Communist Party in China. And we uh, agreed uh, in the late 1970s to normalize relations. <clears throat> Carter was important in that period, but Basically, he was responding to an initiative taken in China. And this had to do with China's great struggle over what the future of the Communist Party's role and what the future of China would be. Deng Xiaoping, as, as beautifully documented in, in Ezra Vogel's volume on his life, uh, he came back to power uh, with a very complicated series of maneuvers to remove rivals and uh, office holders restore previous office holders who'd been disgraced in the Cultural Revolution or other campaigns preceding the Cultural Revolution and try to rebuild the competency of the government and Communist Party in China. And we had this incredible intersection in late 1978 between the 11th Central Committee's third plenum meeting, which was a party meeting in Beijing at the Great Hall of the People and during that same set, uh, series of sessions in Beijing where Deng Xiaoping inaugurated vast reforms that made the, the China today start in the direction that brought it to where it is today. At the same time, between sessions of his third plenum, he was holding uh, negotiating meetings with Leonard Woodcock at the American embassy to try to devise a, a document that would state the future of US-China relations for formal relations and, and find a way to finesse the longstanding US interest in maintaining substantive relations with Taiwan and finessing China's longstanding interest in unification with Taiwan, which would not be achieved through this document uh, establishing US-China relations. So again, we went into a, a period of a decade or so where uh, our ideological differences were not uh, so important as our cooperation. Again, there was a, the Soviet Union was still existing. It was maybe in a tired phase under Brezhnev, but it was still viewed as a principal threat to the US and to China. And we found ways to compromise throughout the 1980s. It wasn't until 1989 when at the same time that the uh, Soviet empire was about to dissolve and China's own uh, three point distinctions of difference with Moscow had been resolved by the arrival of Gorbachev in the Russian leadership that uh, the China and Russia could start to re reduce the salience of their uh, opposition to Russia. And it was simultaneously the same thing was happening in the US uh, first under Reagan and then with uh, George H.W. Bush. Uh, so the edge of Russia in our mutual, our mutual accommodation was being uh, lost. That cement was being lost. The, um, the 1989 marked the beginning of a new phase where we started to look at each other's internal systems more closely. And this became a partisan matter in the US uh, until uh, in the early part of the Clinton administration and then a common pursuit of this post-Cold War uh, unipolar moment with the US leading the world allowed China 
can shadow and develop rapidly at home, uh, its economic uh, capabilities, its openness to the outside world, and the U.S. could uh, look at China as by no means threatening. And this continued really till 2008, 2010. And then the U.S., after a series of own goals, the mess in Iraq, the great financial crisis, uh, all of this um, brought the status of the U.S. low in the eyes of many Chinese and caused them to start examining their own internal succession. Uh, now we go fast forward again to the period when in 2012, Xi Jinping took power. Not everything starts with Xi Jinping, as Bruce Dixon said in his remarks. Uh, things, uh, can, a lot of continuity as well as change. I remember in 2014, writing a piece about how the period when Deng Xiaoping was in charge from the 70s through uh, his successors in the early 2000s, where China would keep a low profile and focus on, uh, on its own domestic affairs and not get into confrontation over systems uh, was coming to an end. And the US series of mistakes in its own self-governance, uh, domestic dysfunction and the like, uh, caused the Chinese to start uh, reevaluating uh, their relevant pos uh, respective position vis-a-vis -vis the US and to uh, begin to be more uh, outspoken. Today we talk about wolf warrior diplomacy, but it started with a period of of assertiveness from the period 2002 to 2017. And then we finally fast forward again to the Reagan arrival, excuse me, excuse me the Trump arrival in Washington and Trump brought back the systemic rivalry that we had not really uh, focused on since the uh, 50s and 60s in the Cold War. And, and that's where we are today. The question now becomes, as Bruce asked questions at the end of his uh, presentation. The question now for us is, how do, we, how do we take this systemic rivalry where we have a newly installed post-Trump Biden government talking about the international order being upset by Chinese behavior and the Chinese saying, what international order? You know, uh, who are you talking to? We've got to, we have to make some important decisions about how far we're going to carry our ideological uh, competition with the Communist Party of China and how much that's going to determine the future of our relations, whether greater uh, long arm competition or something more violent up close uh, and whether we're gonna also be able to conduct diplomacy without regard to the systemic nature of our uh, opposite numbers roles. And that's uh, really where we are today in this hundredth year of the Communist Party's ascension to power in China. I look forward to our onward discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Paul, so much. Our final speaker today is Professor Chi Wang. Professor Wang is president and co-chair of the U.S. China Policy Foundation. Born in Beijing, Professor Wang moved to the U.S. for school in 1949, ultimately receiving a PhD at Georgetown in 1969. He has spent more than seven decades in the United States and has dedicated his career to the improvement of US-China relations. He has served as an advisor to China to top US government officials, headed the Chinese and Korean section at the US Library of Congress, taught Chinese history to future diplomats at Georgetown University, aided in the formation of multiple exchange organizations and more. He has published multiple books on U.S.-China relations and American-China policy. He is also a regular contributor to the South China Morning Post and has published articles in the Diplomat, Huffington Post, the Miami Herald, World Journal, and more. The second edition of his memoir, A Compelling Journey from Peking to Washington, was published earlier this year. Uh, Professor Wong will be discussing the early years of the CCP. Professor Wong. Uh, for me now? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ariane, for organizing this uh, uh, discussion. And I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Dixon, also Ambassador Paul, for joining us to talk about the 100th anniversary of uh, the founding of the CCP. 
And uh, I uh, grew up in China in 1930s and 40s, during the time that uh, Chiang Kai-shek, every day by nothing, just to try to defeat the Chinese communist bandits. And uh, I think after so many years of effort, by 1949, they defeated the Chinese communist people, defeated Chiang Kai-shek, he went to Taiwan and he died in Taiwan. In 1975. I think that the, my personal interest in the Chinese uh, Communist Party founding was that the first, when I was a student at uh, Georgetown in 1960, one of my professors, and uh, he was a, a Columbia uh, student, he went back to China. He served as Chiang Kai-shek's uh, personal secretary. And uh, he told me a lot of interesting stories. And I'm sure he knows uh, uh, what we were talking about. And then uh, he asked me, uh, one to another professor wants to know what is the, the Chinese Communist Party, how they come about? Asked me to write a term paper. <laughs> I said, I'll try. So I wrote a term paper about the founding of a Chinese Communist Party which is about uh, 40, 50 pages, very long. And uh, the professor, he liked it. I, I, I couldn't find the paper anymore. But uh, in 1972, I came here from China in 1949, not over 70 years. My first trip returned to China was after Nixon's trip in 1972, February. And uh, the US government sent me to Beijing to negotiate a student cultural book exchange. So I was sent to Guangdong, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and then Shanghai. And then I was taken to the founding place of the CCP in Shanghai, former French concession. They showed me the, the, the founding uh, place. They, they have a a long conference table with 12, 13 chairs, like a, the, the original uh, conference set. So that's what I began to interest. Uh, in fact, I have a photo. I couldn't find a photo of myself in front of a, a, the, the meeting site. I, I came back. I spent a lot of time uh, trying to find out what exactly happened uh, in my memory. Uh, the, 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 the party was founded in July, 1921, 100 years ago. Exact date, nobody knows. But Mao Zedong said July 1st. Actually, it was not July 1st. I think it's sometime between July 20, July 23rd. And I also look into it. But it doesn't matter which day, but it was found about 100 years ago. At that time, only about 12, 13 young people participated in the founding conference in the French concession townhouse. I think the building is still there. After the party, after three days, the conference, the French police in Shanghai, French concession police tried to stop, arrest them. So they escaped to another lake nearby to finish their founding conference. About 12, 13 members. I know two of them in person. <laughs> when I was a kid, one of them was a student from Japan. His name was Joe C-H-O-W. Bo, F O H A I, Tofu Hai. A study, a student study in, in Japan, Kagoshima University. And he came home in the summer 1921 in China. Another one was a student from Colombia, Mr. Chen Kung Bo, C H E N 
K U N G hyphen P O. He was a Columbia student. And these two from one from US, one from Japan. They also participated in the conference. In fact, I know both of them. I met them in well, I met Mr. Mr. Zhou in 39 when I was in elementary school in Hong Kong. He and my parents are friends. So he came to our home in Hong Kong. So his son and my older brother were roommates in the high school. He, he, he wanted to go to, go to Nanjing more my father to, to help him to keep an eye on his son and daughter too. So I met, I met the, the, one of the founding members, Zhou Fu Hai. Another one, Chen Gong Bo, also I met in Nanjing in 1942. And uh, when we returned from Hong Kong after Japan attacked Hong Kong, I don't want to go into detail. But the first time I really see that the, the meeting site was 1972, June. And uh, the, 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 the escort showed me the place. I was really impressed. I told myself, how could this happen? Just 12, 13 young people get together in a meeting place for three days. And then later on, I established a party, not more than 20, 30 people. How could they survive in those difficult situations? So they went to Guangzhou, to join Dr. Chen Yashen in Guangzhou, and with the Chiang Kai-shek as the Wenho Military Academy. And there's kind of a dual membership. So they began to expand the membership from about 20, 30, slowly into thousands. This is the early years. By 1926, when Chiang Kai-shek start his Northern Expedition campaign to defeat the warlords in China, the Chinese Communist Party member also joined him to fight the warlords. By the time they reached to Shanghai in 1927, Jiang Kai-shek discovered there are thousands members of Chinese counter members also inside his uh, army. So he started to try to kill them. Thousands were butchered by Chiang Kai-shek in 1927. This is uh, very, very bloody. Zhou Enlai was arrested by a, a jailer in Shanghai, but this jailer like this young man, he said, I open the gate, you just go ahead, leave here. And so, and Mao, they went to Jiangxi, Nancheng, with another military guy, Zhu De, CSU, TE. And they together start to establish a small Red Army in Nancheng, August 1st. 1927. And that's the beginning, so called the Red Army. Because of that small, a few hundred, a thousand, and then they moved to the mountainous part in Jiangxi. They stayed there in a place called Region. I think someday we, we all should visit that place as a, like a, uh, the, 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 the place really developed the, the communist army. So from that time on, Chiang Kai-shek tried to wipe out the Chinese Communist Red Army. As a kid, every day I heard how many communists were killed by Chiang Kai-shek. I was in Nanjing, second grade. This is something that uh, uh, you must respect the Chinese Communist Party member, young people, their persistence, 
to fight it out with Seng Sek. So by 1934, 35, Seng Sek squeezed out the Red Army. They had a long march from Jiangxi all the way. It took a year for them to reach Shanxi, Yang'an. This is my understanding. At that time, another young warlord, Zhang Xueliang, lost Manchuria. Japan attacked Manchuria in 1931. And uh, he was so humiliated by the, the, the defeat by Japanese. So he wanted to fight back Japan instead of fighting Chinese communists. In 1936, December 12, when Chiang Kai-shek arrived in Xi'an, tried to ask the young marshal Zhang Xuliang to get rid of Mao Zedong's 8,000 troops in Yang'an. He didn't do that. He arrest Chiang Kai-shek, force him to sign, say, we got to fight Japanese first. And that's the turning point for the survival of the Chinese Red Army. I was in Nanjing, second grade. I remember Chiang Kai-shek's Secret Service surrounded our house because my father was one of the, the top leader of Manchurian army from 1919 to 1935. I also remember Madame Zhang and her relative H.H. H. Kung, the guy control the finance, came to our home to ask my father to call young Marshal Zhang Hiliang, do not kill, harm Zhang kai I remember that. I think it, that is in my early years understanding how the communist army start. But the, the CIA incident really changed everything for the future of Mao Zedong. Who was the one negotiate with the Zhou Enlai? My cousin. He was the commander of 53rd Army. And he was also later on trying to defend in Manchuria in 1948. And he was uh, captured. He died in the country camp in 1954. But this is my personal understanding of uh, the early years of the Chinese Communist Party. And uh, we must say, the young people from China in 1920s, they really wanted to make China look better. Nobody know at the time what China can look like. I wasn't born yet. So this is what uh, I remember. And also, I, 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 went, I mentioned earlier, I went to Shanghai, 1972. They showed me the, 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 the conference site. I was really much impressed. A 12, 13, young people able to expand to a situation 20 some years later, defeat Chiang Kai-shek's millions army. And then by 1949, October 1st, declare the founding of the People's Republic of China. And that's what we have so-called People of Republic China, or we call them Communist China today. Now they have uh, almost 90 million party members. This is a, a small start, early years. So that tells us if you want to do something, if you determine to do it, you could do it. I think uh, this is what I want to say. I think I talk too much already. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ariane. Welcome, guys. I'd be happy to answer questions if you want to.
Thanks so much, Professor Wong. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, if we can take a little bit of time to take a few questions. There were some that were submitted ahead of time. And so let's go ahead and, and start jump into those. So the first question is, during the Trump administration, there was an increasing focus on demonizing and delegitimizing the Chinese Communist Party. Has rhetoric shifted in the Biden administration and in what way? Well, I, I think it's fair to say the rhetoric has shifted, uh, but the main line of policy has not revealed itself to have shifted. A, a lot of what I interpret the Biden early moves with respect to China involved is maintaining uh, the bipartisan support for a strong uh, posture vis-a-vis -vis China, ideologically, economically, uh, in security terms as well. And uh, while Biden himself and his, his key people are not as given to flights of rhetoric as much as the Trump people were, uh, they do not want to alienate the support they believe they enjoy on a bipartisan basis in the administration. And I don't expect to see a lot of change. The Biden people have laid out a patient platform of first rebuilding relations with our friends and allies. And we've just seen that with meetings with the prime minister of Japan, the president of South Korea, the European leaders, NATO leaders uh, in the last few weeks, and then meeting with Russia's uh, President Putin. Uh, sometime in October, November, we expect to see Biden himself in a situation where it'll be likely he'll meet with his counterpart, President Xi. Between now and then, I would expect to see some diplomatic exchanges, uh, new ambassadors in both capitals, uh, some uh, American diplomats going to China at lower high, but, not, but lower than uh, the top levels to see if there's some basis for uh, a more concrete uh, constructive relationship with Beijing or to lay down strong complaints about the things we see going on in, Ch in China, such as the uh, allegations from the current administration of, of um, genocide among the Uyghur peoples of Xinjiang and uh, strong positions taken on Tibet, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. Uh, it's another way of saying all this in short is it's a little too early to say the Biden people don't want to tell us quite yet. They don't think they're ready to lay out their cards. And so there's more continuity than change. I'll just add a, a quick thought, is, which is that the, the change of rhetoric in, in itself is important, especially to the, the Chinese leaders uh, who saw the type of rhetoric coming out of Washington, especially from President Trump, as um, just, just insulting. Um, and so even though the policies are largely going to remain, more importantly, um, there's an effort to try and work with allies to to deal with that challenge from China. Um, so in some ways, it's not just, it is an important change of rhetoric, but will help build alliances, help build uh, collaborative efforts. Um, and I think will also allow China to find ways of, of dealing with the US administration in ways that it had a hard time doing with the Trump administration. Thank you so much. So the next question is, the Chinese Communist Party is increasingly being tied to the, um, to the realization of the Chinese dream. What impact could this have on the future of the CCP? Well, I think the, the Chinese dream is, was a phrase that uh, Xi Jinping coined. So it really is both tied to his um, status and his legacy, uh, as well as what the party will do. Um, and it's meant to really be something that would uh, galvanize uh, the country behind it to try and achieve sort of a greater international stature for China, uh, both politically, economically, and, and other ways. Um, originally, the, the phrase has, was sort of an, an empty shell. It wasn't clear what it meant. In some ways, it echoes back to the, back to the going back to the Qing Dynasty 
uh, about this dream of having a wealthy and powerful country. Um, and that aspiration has continued. Uh, and you know, one manifestation of it is the, the Belt and Road Initiative that has been uh, successful in, in sort of tying China with a, a number of different countries uh, for building large infrastructure projects. It's been controversial in a variety of ways. It's been pushed back within those countries. Uh, but I think at home, it, it, it plays very well. It, it looks as though uh, China's status uh, is rising since the, the party controls the message that it goes out within, within the country. Uh, most people in China only hear the party's version of the Chinese dream and not maybe the international reaction to it. Um, so it's, it's part and parcel of how the party is building support for itself that allows it to uh, to remain in power. It's, it's not just using sort of more repressive tools to stay in power. It's also generating support in a variety of ways. And one way is through um, this, this new, relatively new phrase of the Chinese dream. Thank you. Um, Dr. Paul, did you have anything to add? I, I don't really, um, I, I was on Chinese television a few times right after the China dream phrase was used and my Chinese interlocutors were quite excited about it and they kept asking me what I thought it meant and I, I had to say, I really don't know. But today, if you go to China, and not many people are, but if you go to China today, you'll see China dream all over the poster boards of urban areas and each one emphasizes something else. It's become a catch-all phrase for anything good, kind of like a 1930s, uh, New Deal uh, expression, which is trying to spread a feeling of good uh, will and satisfaction among the people to keep them supporting the leadership uh, in this case in Beijing. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Professor Wong, did you want to add something? Let me, uh, let me say a few words, okay? Sure, of course. And uh, uh, based on my personal experience, and uh, I grew up during the anti-communist years at Chiang Kai-shek. I also saw the Red Army enter Be Beijing in 1949, February. I was on the street, welcomed them to the Beijing street. As a young high school kid, just graduated, ready to go to college. And the young people in China was all hope a communist Chinese can do better for the future of China. Because everybody was disappointed with Chiang Kai-shek's selfish motive. During those years, everybody like me in high school studied Mao Zedong's writing on the new democracy. I have no idea what it is, but we just read it, the, the booklet on new democracy in high school. Our teachers, they were underground party members. They told us the future of China is in the hands of Mao Zedong. When you are in high school, after that kind of, a, what do we call it, propaganda? or indoctrination, you have to believe what they say. But I was uh, just, because I want to go to study in the US. So I left in April, 1949. It took me two weeks from Beijing by horse car, truck, bicycle to race to Qingdao. At that time, Qingdao was still belonged to Kuomintang control. From Qingdao, I flew to Shanghai, and then I flew to Taiwan, and then I flew to Hong Kong. I flew to US 49, September. I'm still here today. I saw the China with World War fighting each other. My father was one of the World Wars top generals, Zhang Zhuolin and Zhang Xueliang. 
And uh, when I reached to Hong Kong, I was so lucky, able to see the, the Chinese airline, see, you see civil uh, aviation airline manager. He worked for my father. He said, I sell your ticket half price, $600 US. I bought a ticket from Hong Kong, flew to San Francisco. It took me three days to fly over uh, to San Francisco. When I get to San Francisco, ah, I couldn't be, I couldn't be, I saw the Golden Gate Bridge. It was so impressive. This is America. I couldn't believe my eyes. I love America since 1949, September. And then a Catholic priest met me at the airport. He took me to San Francisco, Chinatown. We had a good Chinese lunch. That I will never forget. I love America since I've been here, San Francisco. But I got a scholarship in New York Mahatma College, a Catholic college for boys. I was lucky, able to have that kind of opportunity. And uh, I'm still here today, 70 years later, and talk to Dr. Dixon, Ambassador Paul, and, and Ariane Yu. And this is a country, the best in the world. I'm not trying to say, Something else. I think I don't know how many people like me have this kind of experience. I was also going back in China in 72 June with a request by Ambassador John Holdridge. He was a White House NSC's advisor. I actually go to China to do a new exchange relationship, I did. Then I was really see the real China in 72. So poor, so people get starved. In, in June 72, I traveled to Shenzhen, nothing but a fishing village. And then I traveled to Guang, Guangzhou, nothing but Chairman Mao's Quotations, we must liberate Taiwan. Big posters, a POA carry a rifle. We must liberate Taiwan. We were eating like Taiwan. That was 1972, June. So I went to Guangzhou. From Guangzhou, I go to Changsha. Hangzhou, and then from Hangzhou, I took a train. I like to eat egg, handmade egg fried rice on the train, dining, dining car. So I went to Shanghai. Oh, Shanghai was a, a much different than Hangzhou. Because I was in Shanghai from 1939 to 1941 during the World War II. I live in French concession. It was a much poorer than 1939. I said, this is no way for China to continue. I met a professor from Fudan University. And then the professor at Fudan Professor Tang was a Cornell PhD in genetics. He asked me, Mr. Wang, if you can help us, give us our young people a chance, go to the US to see the new America. So I did. I went to Beijing. I met another American educator, Professor of Physics at Beida, Professor Zhou Peiyuan. He also understood, Mr. Wang, please help our young people go to the US to learn something really new so we can make a better China. 
I did. I came back. I told everything to the State Department, the White House. I gave a lot of speeches throughout. And later on, the first group of Chinese students came over here, 80 students. That's the beginning of a new China. The Chinese students came here, mostly scientists. But this is my personal experience. And the Chinese today, I think Xi Jinping, he had no experience through this kind of a so so is uh, 100 years. I saw the up and downs. How China is so, so poor. Now China is now one of the most powerful countries in Asia. I think, I hope America can work with China to develop a better relation with both countries. Not Thank you, Professor. Fighting Wang. against each other. Nobody's going to win. Thanks, Professor. This is my hope. I'm, I'm too old to even, even do anything. Thank you. I, guess I better stop here. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your life story with us. It was very interesting, Professor Wong. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, so the last question will be, um, last week, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan suggested the possibility of a Biden-Xi meeting. What would a successful meeting between the two leaders look like? Doug, I'm looking at you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, one of the things that um, my experience has taught me is that we try to establish normal communications. Um, if you elevate expectations for uh, massive achievements at these meetings, you're going to guarantee yourself disappointment. Uh, what we really need to do is get back to regular procedure, uh, starting at the very bottom and working our way up. Um, we've, in the closing days of the Trump administration, the Chinese and American governments closed consulates in Chengdu and in uh, uh, Houston. Uh, we could reopen those. We've ended our program of exchanges of, of uh, teachers under the Fulbright uh, under the Peace Corps, these could be resumed. Uh, we, Biden made a small uh, gesture, but an important one by regularizing visa issuance for students to return to schools when COVID is over uh, as an issue for attending American schools. And I hope uh, it'll have a reciprocal effect in China. Uh, getting down to business like this is important. Then there are lots of other things at a state to state level. Uh, that can be done between the US and China. One possibility, they will be meeting at the G20, they have the potential to meet at the G20 meeting in Rome on October 30 or 31. And there they can talk about uh, coordinating policies to re-energize global economics, which is the function of the G20 since the first leaders meeting after the global financial crisis in 2008-9. Uh, they, subsequently, in November 1 and 2, there's going to be a meeting in Glasgow, Scotland, of the parties to the uh, Paris Convention on Climate Change. And there, too, the U.S. and China have the potential to make some steps forward uh, together or separately, but on the parallel path to uh, helping to uh, moderate the expansion of climate forcing events uh, in both of our important countries. Uh, so th there's a lot to be done of a more prosaic um, nature, not day-to-day -day because this is uh, more important than the day-to-day -day stuff that's been taking place recently, but not the kind of thing that uh, changes the course of history overnight. That would be my expectation for a successful and sustainable summit meeting between the two leaders. You know, you think back to last week's meeting between President Biden and President Putin of Russia hailed as a historic meeting, and yet nothing came out of it. Uh, you just had two leaders who 
were both acting presidential. They talked for a couple of hours and then they went up their separate ways. And so if that is the standard for a historic successful meeting, then I think the odds are pretty good for a similarly successful meeting between Biden and Xi. But uh, I completely agree with, uh, with Doug that creating expectations for some kind of a breakthrough, some major change uh, in orientation is unlikely. What's, what's important is to get the top levels communicating with each other so that in between subsequent meetings like this, you actually get progress on the more difficult issues. Uh, these high level meetings are as much about ceremony and diplomacy as they are about actual substance, actually much more than they're about substance. Uh, but without these meetings, it's hard to make any progress on the other issues of substance that we need to work on. We did have one important meeting in Anchorage between um, the National Security Advisor, Secretary of State and their counterparts in China. And um, the, the I think the the common takeaway from that was they were all acting like jerks. Um, we can't expect much at their level, apparently. Um, and what people are telling me is that when uh, Xi Jinping and Biden have been on the phone, the conversations have been much more reasonable than what we saw on display and then behind closed doors in Anchorage. And so I think it's only for the good that we get these leaders uh, to be speaking directly to each other. Thank you so much. Uh, that's all the time today that we have for questions. I would like to again thank our panelists for taking the time to share their insightful remarks. And thank you all for joining us here today. We hope you will attend future panel discussions. You can join our email newsletter to stay up to date 